how do you hold on to your light no matter what's happening around you? We don't hold on. Huh? Hold on to my precious, precious. <laughs> I need it so much. I need to hold on to it so tight. It's my precious. You don't need to hold on. It's true. <laughs> you don't need to hold on to anything. That's the answer that you were looking for. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm hosting um, a very interesting man. He's a non-ceremonial shaman and an alchemist. His name is Andro, and uh, he also writes poetry, and he is far beyond what I just described him as it's just words to introduce someone. Um, so uh, let's dive in with Andro, and we're going to be talking about consciousness, life, and everything else. Hello, uh, Judith. Or should I say, hey, Jude? Hey, Jude, yeah. Nice to, yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. So, Andrew, uh, would you just um, first introduce yourself the way you'd like to be introduced? Like, uh, tell me about like your journey for shaman shamanism. I want to hear your in, in your own words how your journey started. A shaman, it's it's just a name, you know. It's it's a label. It's not something I identify it as, as. It's it's just a name. Shamanism has many connotations by many people. Um, I remember many years ago, I got a call from a lady who wanted to work with a shaman and she asked me if I have a drum. And I told her, no, I do not have a drum. And she was like quite upset. And, no, you're not a real shaman. How can you be a shaman without a drum? So, uh, so she was apparently not looking for a shaman. She was looking for a, a drum. Uh, and uh, all these um, superficial labels that we associate with shamanism, I sometimes ask people uh, about what a shaman is supposed to be according to their view, and uh, I get many different answers. Like someone who talks with animals, someone who connects with spirit guides, someone who uh, uses uh, plant medicine, uh, and all those are not necessarily incorrect. I mean, they're all right, but... It's not what shamanism is about. Shamanism is, I think, first and foremost about the ability to see things as they are without prejudice and act accordingly without delay. This is maybe the best definition of shamanism that I could ever come across or come up with in my case. Like I said in the mirrors video, most people cannot really see each other. Most people, when they talk with us, they are talking with reflections of themselves. They are talking with what they project on us. So if someone calls you names, they are talking to themselves. They are talking on their own projections. They are talking to their own insecurities. If someone makes a judgment on you, a value judgment, they are judging themselves. So most people, they do not have this capacity to actually see an other because they have not yet reached the ability to accurately see and know themselves. And basically, it's just dancing in the dark. So I understand the, the, the concept that we project, we project on each other but when when we are describing an act if somebody for example if you take someone who lied or raped or killed doesn't mean that we actually do that in human form like as a 3d or separate so is it every time somebody um talks about another person, are they always projecting? Or are they only projecting their ideas? 
My answer is pretty much yes. Because uh, projecting our ideas about someone else will inevitably, almost always, involve a sort of preconceived judgment. And you chose the more so-called negative examples, criminals, rapists, but we can choose even the most positive, someone who is a big philanthropist, someone who did many good deeds. We're projecting our own perceptions of them without seeing them who they really are. We only see the labels that we are aware of. Right. And if we label someone as a rapist or as a criminal or as a psychopath, how much more of them do you think we'll be able to see? And I would like to reference something I saw on your website. You wrote in one of the letters that you wrote to psychopaths, I think it was Ted Bundy. No, I think it was uh, Gacy, I think. Uh By the way, your art isn't so bad. I think I saw it on your website. So yeah, you're you're a you're a ma- you're a murderer and a psychopath, but your art is is kind of okay, and this is an example of not projecting the whole label. I mean, yeah. that's an example of seeing someone beyond the label. Yes, someone has a very negative label, like a killer, a psychopath, a rapist, those bad things. But you did notice that the art is not so bad. So you were right. able, even for a moment, to see beyond the label. But for most people, it's very difficult after the label has been put on the person, it's very difficult to see anything else. And even if the description is correct, it is usually not complete. We just stick to one narrative and ignore everything else. I'm not saying to ignore the fact that things do happen and Sometimes they are perceived as great. Sometimes they are perceived as horrible. But those things are never the whole, whole picture. So whether we look at a at someone we perceive as a saint or someone we perceive as a psychopath, there's always more to the picture than the label that we initially put on the person. Right. I I, under, I understand that uh, aspect. So, so if, if, for example, the, the thing, my struggle with this is that, for example, if somebody, um, goes through something really tough, uh, at the hands of somebody else and the person needs, um, help in some manner and then somebody comes and says, you're just projecting or you're just, that's just a mirror or you're playing the victim, then a lot of people, end up not getting the help they need because it just waters gets watered down into some kind of a judgment or or projection. That's a great example. I worked with a young lady not too long ago who underwent uh, abuse as a child by her own family member. And she didn't speak about it for years. And finally, instead of, she tried to go to reach out to a psychotherapist who told her, no, it didn't happen. You uh, made it all up. And then she heard about me. Her mother heard about me and she booked a shamanic uh, journey with me. And uh, I did the journey, but in our preliminary talks, I asked her not to place the events that happened, not to deny them, of course, but not to place them in a special category. Mm. It's just something that happened. Not to, not to feed it. Not to put so much importance on it. Because you know what? Nobody owes us anything and shit happens and life is not fucking fair. Right. And you know what? It happened to you. So what? Two days ago, you went out for ice cream. Guess what? This happened too. Because things happen, and sometimes nice things happen, and sometimes bad shit happens. Yeah. And we don't need to cling on to any of those because life is not fair, and and shit happens, and things happen. Mm. But us giving them importance they only amplify 
the effect this narrative has on us. It's not denial. It's not the, I'm not advocating for the way of the ostrich. I'm not advocating burying the head in the sand. Not at all. What I'm saying is stop giving those things importance. I mean, even if you have been a victim, legitimate victim of an assault, it's your right to seek justice if you see it fit. It's your right to heal yourself, but it's counterproductive to give it so much importance. Because at some point, instead of seeking justice, we are starting to grow the victim inside ourselves. So yes, life isn't fair, and yes, horrible things do happen, but we do not have to stay victims. We do not have to be victims because things happen. This is life, the way it goes. Some people are born in horrible circumstances. Some people are born in great circumstances and they both suffer in different ways. Mm -hmm. Suffering spares no one. And we cannot compare suffering because everyone's suffering is subjective. A teenage girl in the Midwest of the US of A is about to go to the prom and she has just this giant pimple or zit on her forehead and her life is ruined and her <laughs> suffering is unbearable and unimaginable. And people who do statistics would say, oh, but it's nothing compared to the suffering of a starving child in Africa. And I say, no, you cannot compare. Her suffering is real. So let's not quantify suffering. Let's not grade it because things happen. So, and the more we feed the importance of what happened, the more we keep ourselves, we become our own wardens in the prisons of our own mind. And I have this great example. I had a friend, he started out as a client. He used to be an alcoholic for the first, until age 44 or something like that. And he used to go to all the AA meetings and uh, hello, my name is mm -mm, and I'm an alcoholic and it, it never did, did, him, did him any good. And at some point he decided like, why am I going to these meetings and why am I repeating that I'm an alcoholic? <laughs> and he realized he's just enforcing the narrative. Exactly. I'm not a fucking alcoholic. He stopped going to the meetings. He stopped defining himself as an alcoholic and he indeed stopped drinking. And he made a great business and made a truckload of money uh, after being broke most of his life. But at, his, at some point he realized this is this AA, this hello, my name is mm, and I'm an alcoholic. It, it feeds the AA narrative. It doesn't help him. What good is it to reinforce the alcoholic label? Day after day after day after day. One day he decides, I'm not going to use that label anymore. I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not drinking, I'm something else. And he was uphill from there. Once yes. he rejected the label, I'm not a victim anymore. This thing happened, this thing happened, wasn't good, wasn't useful. I disengaged from it and I moved the fuck on. Because shit happens, it doesn't have to stay that way. An right. old narrative, changes into a new one and we can write it but we have to stop reinforcing the old one in our own minds so even in the hardest cases if we've been vi victims of, of abuse of violence of attacks assaults we cannot go on identifying as victims for our entire lives and even if our anger is real and justified we cannot let this anger control our lives. Yeah. We can transmute it into, uh, into uh, let's call it self-righteous rage mm. to change the narrative, to change your own life story. But what do you do with the rage? Does rage end or does person end up, like how, how do you use rage but without becoming 
that for the rest of your life. You transmute the rage. Emotions can transmute the 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 energy has a certain frequency and at that frequency let's call it rage. Mm. If we rise above it, the rage will will still be there. Like we cannot eradicate rage from life. But it doesn't mean that we have to stay in this rage country. We can emigrate. We can go to a different place. We can live in a place of grace. So the rage will still be there. It's just that Alice doesn't live there anymore. But I need to ask you what you think then about the the impact of the environment on the person. Like if you're living in an environment that is, I, I think the environment really determines how smoothly you can transition from the rage into the gratitude into grace from being on survival mode versus creativity yeah that's a very good point that you're bringing up here and it brings me back to the mirrors because the people in our lives they're also mirrors and we define ourselves and we understand ourselves by seeing ourselves in the reflections of the people that surround us but there is a trick with those mirrors with those those organic mirrors every mirror has its own reflection threshold it can not reflect light beyond its own threshold so if you surround yourself with people who have remained the same but you have grown beyond a certain threshold the same people will still keep reflecting the old you right even if you've changed, you'll get fake impressions that you haven't. So if your story changes, and as it happens with most people who manage to break out of certain old narratives and embrace new ones, almost invariably you'll find that they change their circle of acquaintances. Sometimes they even leave their families behind. Sometimes they leave their countries behind. Because the old mirrors, they have a threshold and they can only reflect back to them what they used to be. So they seek out new people with a higher reflection threshold who can reflect them for who they are right now. Okay? And that's the the parable, Andrew's parable of the old mirrors. It's in one of my uh, seminars. In this, it's in the Shamanic Vision Seminar, if I remember. So sometimes we have to discard the old mirrors because... In the old mirrors, we will still be that person. We will still be the victim. We will still we would still be that little scared girl, and we don't want those mirrors anymore. So what do we say to people that are kind of stuck in a location? They cannot leave a location. They don't have freedom of movement. Is it? Are you talking about prison? Um, I'm talking about prison, and I'm talking about people from certain countries that don't have freedom to just move like other places? Well, there are ways. First of all, uh, in countries where uh, there's limit limits on movement between borders, uh, you can still go elsewhere, technically. You can move from the city to the village or from the village to the city. You can seek out uh, a group of people that resonates better with you. Somehow, in even in prison, in prisons, there are gangs, and some gangs reflect you better than the other gangs. Or you right. can be a loner and be a survivor. That's that also works. But you know what? There's always a way. There's always a way. Even if we have to do the unthinkable and be our own fucking mirrors, that works too and be so brutally and directly honest with ourselves that we don't even need those organic mirror, mirrors anymore in the form of other people. We can become become solitary, and we can be brutally honest and look ourselves in our own mental eye mirror and, and see ourselves for what we are, what we've become, and find solitude and grace within ourselves. It's a more difficult thing to arrive at, but it's not impossible and it's doable. Mm -hmm. So even 
in places that seem geographically or otherwise unescapable, we can still go elsewhere, even if this elsewhere is only in our minds. We can block out the reflections. Mm -hmm. We can close the blinders on the windows. It's just me, myself, and I. And I'm not in this story anymore. My body is here, but my mind is not living in this area anymore. And this is how healing is accomplished. And this is how I managed with this young lady that has been through genuine abuse at a very young age. In only three or four meetings, her life just switched around. We could say maybe she saved years of psychotherapy. Because uh, a licensed psychotherapist will never tell her the stuff that I told her. Listen, it just happened. You, you, you have to stop and you will stop labeling yourself as a victim because things happen. And this person is no longer in your life, so why are you still there? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like a very, like to an outsider, it might, might sound like, where's your compassion? You must like encourage and, oh, you've been a victim and you've been like, oh, it's so sad. But I'm not going to feed this victim persona because I don't want it to be there anymore. Exactly. I want her to change to a new narrative. It just happened because life is not fair and shit happens always. Do we have to live in the shit? Fuck no. We relocate and we write ourselves a new story. Well, if, if life is, is just one massive projection from that source, that consciousness, then how do you balance between knowing that and still being engaged in life in this dimension? My own engagement with uh, most of the world has been reduced to very little engagement. I've become, except I'm very lucky to have uh, two friends that I share uh, a house and a life and a work with. And we're like brothers. We're like, we are house Lorian. Uh, and uh, you probably see that on, seen that on the website. Yeah. But other than those people, I rarely interact with anyone except occasionally on video or if I, whenever I have people that want to work with me shamanically. And even that I'm going to, gradually retire from that. Uh, my interaction with the world is kept at a bare minimum. And uh, it's not as much a choice, but at some point it becomes inevitable, becomes a necessity. I just can't do it anymore. Right. How do you feel when you need to engage in the world? Like how does it make, does it make you feel drained? No, it doesn't drain me at all. I keep a sense of detachment and uh, there is something of a paradox when you feel more liberated, uh, when one feels more liberated in their lives, they don't seek out engagements with people. They don't, uh, it's a bit of a paradox. They don't, they're not bound by morality or by uh, good deeds. They're not, they realize that freedom is freedom and it's unconditioned. So it's a paradoxical realization that when you become liberated in your mind and heart, you realize that it's okay to heal and it's okay to kill. And none of that matters in the end because the divine spark has no beginning and therefore it can have no end. You cannot literally kill consciousness. But the paradox in this is that when you reach this level of awakening and you are no longer held back by social programmings of morality and right and wrongs, you develop insane level of compassion for everyone. Even though you know that it's all fair game, you start to literally see yourself in every stranger's eyes. And when you do interact, it's inevitably from a place of grace. What What do you do when, when you you know that um, 
you're all one and there is you look at everyone with the eyes of compassion and then you see somebody abusing an animal i mean the concept of cruelty if there is so much cruelty in the world why do we perceive the cruelty because of our own morality or thoughts about it is that or is it the pain that is telling us hey something cruel is going on because some somebody is in pain or this animal is in pain and then you it's it's very easy to get to step out of that alignment and out of that compassion for the person in that moment it's hard to integrate sometimes it's difficult from an engaged mind uh, an engaged mind operates from causes and from uh, morality and what they believe is the right thing to do and the thing is that whether we do or we don't life goes on and shit guess what will still happen it will still happen so the the compassion is infinite but the more liberated the mind is the more one steps away from the various agendas of saving this and fighting for that cause uh random acts of kindness occur a lot if it's helping someone in pain if it's doing a random act of kindness but the point here is to catch yourself unprepared the point here is not to have a flag with an agenda i want to save the animals i want to end suffering i want to uh improve the condition of mankind like causes are like chains we got to catch ourselves unprepared doing random acts of kindness and the irony of it that the strongest leadership we can exhibit is in the way we live we live our own lives because this thing is getting broadcast not on the radio Yeah. the way we live our lives in grace compassion and detachment and random acts of kindness without a flag up our asses and without an agenda this thing gets broadcast and we are leading by example yes we can energetically yes and we can literally lead by example by never leaving our home by or never leaving, leaving our home our, our home, home. we can lead by example by rarely stepping out of the house because this stuff gets broadcast we lead by the way we live our lives right that's why uh, there's a saying that uh, those who crave to be uh, in power and claim to want to change the world how many attempts have there been to change the world and make it a better place how many idealistic leaders tried and look it, at the world we're living in now it doesn't really work um maybe it inspires some people there's always going to be both ends of the spectrum at play and yet like at some point you realize that uh, you can do a lot of good and there will be someone who will do equal or greater amount of bad and if you do bad there will come someone else who will do equal or greater amounts of good So it's the duality that we are deal we have to deal with the duality you're saying we cannot ever transcend that duality while we're here We can transcend it to a large extent by detaching from the dualistic narratives Right Liberation is not about leaving a legacy liberation is not about saving the world it's not about uh making the world a better place it doesn't exclude random acts of kindness it does not exclude compassion but it's not liberation is not about having agendas and saving this for this or that cause liberation is not about causes liberation is not political liberation is not even more guided by morality liberation is as the word says liberty freedom it's unconditioned as the song says uh freedom's just not a word for nothing left to lose right but are we actually free how how do you know we're actually free and versus just thinking we're free when we're really not 
I guess we'll know when we get there. But we can notice the progress. We can uh, be our own, we can take our own freedom pulse and see how much we are affected by narratives, be there good or bad, and see how much they affect us, how much ingress they have into our own minds. How detached are we really, or how attached are we really? How immersed are we in the narratives that are being pushed into us 24 seven? Can we just like remove the clouds of narratives? Because with all these clouds, how can we ever possibly see the sun? Like I always say, we don't have to turn on the sun, it's always on. We just have to remove the clouds. And all those narratives and agendas and good or bad and, and legacies and saving and, and flags and, and, and social reforms, they're clouds. They're blinding us from the sun. They're blinding us from the light of what we are and never were anything else but it. So it sounds, uh, it can sound counterintuitive and yeah, but what about the world and what about suffering? What about suffering indeed? Even Buddha said that life is suffering. And and suffering is not suffering because if all there was was suffering, we didn't we wouldn't know it's suffering. Suffering is a sine wave between the lowest points and the highest points. We're miserable and then we're happy, and then we're miserable again. And within this change of states, that's where suffering occurs. Suffering requires both misery and happiness. Okay. Suffering requires both suffering and relief. Suffering is the amplitude. They raise you up, they bring you down. That's suffering. Suffering is the sine wave. That's the snake, so to speak. I never heard someone put it this way before. Like, so suffering is needs both. It's If somebody's always miserable, then they're less likely to feel the suffering than somebody who's tasted the joy as well. But yeah, uh, well, that's why we're talking. You're talking with me right now uh, to get a different angle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but suffering is a sine wave. Is the snake of the ups and the downs. If all there was was downs, then it's a flat line. We don't know it's suffering. We don't know it's happiness. We don't. We cannot label it. We don't have a point of reference. Once we have. A Hertzian wave with an amplitude. We go from up to down, from down to up. When we're down, we are addicted to the hopium of getting up again. And when we're up again, we are ruled by the fear of our happiness ending and going back down. So suffering is all over the sine wave. Suffering is a curve, and I'm not. I'm not believe I'm going to use this word, but uh, ending suffering is akin to flattening the curve. Is is a is a what? Ending suffering is like is comparable, akin to flattening the curve. Right. <laughs> it's a expression that's been used a lot, like yeah. few years ago, but yeah. I still find it funny, so I'm using it in a, in a different context. I'm reclaiming. Curve like and it's um, but yes, yeah, suffering is a curve and suffering is a sine wave. So suffering requires both joy and misery. Yes, you can go back wherever you want. I want to go back a moment, the way you coherently explain that things happen and without our own... Um, efforts to try and change and impact and all of that it it this reminds me of this fine line i always see between the buddhism and the psychopathy because in the end it's all the same if we what is the difference between seeing something and knowing it's going to happen anyway whether i interfere or not Versus somebody who just doesn't care and doesn't have empathy. I'm starting to better understand your correlation, which is very interesting between a Buddhist and a psychopath. And I find it fascinating that you made this connection. 
Uh, however, they are not exactly the same. Uh, right. A psychopath is, at least according to the official definition, is someone who is literally incapable of feeling emotions, yeah. such as compassion. Not even rage, not even anger. Uh, they they and, have anger. In this regard, at least, I don't know if they have anger. anger. Maybe they can only feel the lower emotions. I don't know. I don't think I have met any full-blown psychopath in my life. Uh, I may have, and without my knowledge, but uh, the official definition, at least, is that they cannot feel emotions. And in a very counterintuitive and paradoxical way, psychopaths are, in a way, more liberated than non-psychopaths. But right. at some point, this comparison stops. Because a liberated being is not incapable of feeling emotions. A liberated be being can feel the entire spectrum of emotions. It just doesn't identify with them. Okay. Okay? And this is a major difference. And this is where the comparison between an accomplished Buddhist master and a run-of-the-mill psychopath comes to an abrupt end. Right. Because let's say a Buddhist master or a being who is close to liberation can feel the entire spectrum of human emotions and can empathize with all of it, but does not become immersed because it knows it's just the wind of narratives, like a hurricane, like a tornado, and a liberated being lives from within the zero point, the eye of the storm, where it's always quiet. And emotions can storm around, and they are all observed, and they are all felt. But the presence is not within the emotions. The presence is in a in the center, in the quiet point. And this is what, where the comparison between a psychopath and a Buddhist master ends. So yes, we can perceive psychopath as more liberated from societal constructs up to a point. But the liberated being is not blocked from feeling emotions. In fact, it's the opposite. A liberated being can feel the entire spectrum of human emotions without identifying with them. Imagine a, a tornado of emotions like anger, fear, we're surrounding. I can feel the world. I can feel what's happening in the world. I can feel the, 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 the tears of joy and the tears of loss and misery. I can almost feel other people's heartbreak in my own heart if I don't learn to shut myself off. But I don't have to live in, in this tornado, in this hurricane. So how do we become helpful? How do we, how do we help? Like, do we still help, though? I told you the best way to help. By personal example. By living in the eye of the storm. Because this stuff is broadcasting. Yeah. It's even strange for me that I've, my path has taken me to be slightly more public because people who go on this path are usually even much more reclusive than I am. For certain reasons, uh, my path led me to be a little bit more public, but this is for a different reason because it's my job to to publish certain information uh, that the best of my knowledge has not been made publicly available in recent centuries of, or millennia in our known history. Right. But that has nothing to do with shamanism. So uh, I had to put this thing out. And this is my main focus currently, my main focus in the linear temporary reality. I have other goals, but uh, in this reality, I I don't have an agenda to help. I don't have an agenda to help others liberate. It's just something that it's it's my own point of choicelessness. Okay. It's uh, I'm sure you you're familiar with this feeling that you just have to do it. You feel that you have no choice. Life has led you to this point. Like 
like I say in, the, uh, in this shamanic vision seminar, life is the best initiator. And I've known uh, not many, but other shamans who have been to like, some of them have initiated, have been initiated by other shamans. And some people just went to like a weekend course in, in Europe, like shaman school, and what they learned to like uh, work with feathers and summon power animals. And this is like, okay. But uh, yeah. shamanic initiation is is not something you get over a weekend. Right. I mean, I've I've been through harsh initiations, harsh life initiations, in the waking state and in the out of body lucid dream state for twelve years or more before I even started working with clients. More than twelve years. Right. And you and you heard the call to to do this. I guess I had it in me before that, but the greatest call, like you saw in that video, is when my father died and appeared to me, like visually, and I was awake. And I wanted to complete cognitive dissonance, like what the fuck is going on? And uh, and because I had a very strong emotional connection with him, my whole identity was shattered. And uh, and something new had to be rebuilt because the old me wasn't working anymore. It was dead. What was it like? What were you like before? What was the old you? Insecure. Arrogant, knowing everything, skeptical of everything, uh, sarcastic, cynical, uh, smart, quite intelligent, not a genius. I was never a genius. Above average, gifted, one might say, but uh, never a genius, really. Uh, but very insecure, very insecure, very much trying to create a fake persona and to create a comfort zone in which this predatory world cannot get too close to me and eat me alive. <laughs> and uh, this whole shield of fake persona that I've built around myself, when my father died, it, it crashed completely. It was destroyed. And something, someone that you cared for so much is suddenly gone. Who the fuck are you now? Right. Who the fuck are you now? And and this is a question that maybe I didn't ask it in those particular words, but that was definitely the question. Who am I now? Especially that my father is gone and I had a very strong connection with him and I was quite young when he died. Uh, not a child, I was 17, 18. But the fact that he appeared to me in the waking state, a few months after he died, that drove me nuts. And that like, after having to deal with, am I going crazy or what the fuck's going on? Uh, you saw it in the video of the, uh, this little outtake from the Shamanic Vision Seminar. I am telling the whole story there. Uh, it took me to a psychiatrist and I started to have out of body experiences, but this was the trigger. This was the, first major initiation that life gave me. There were smaller ones before, there were many after, but it was the big, the first big initiation that life gave me. Loss. When something of your persona is like gone with the fucking wind, who are you now? And if you cannot answer the question, you're gonna lose your soul pieces and you're gonna 20 years later, you're going to look for someone like me to, to bring them all back. Yeah. So who, who are you now? Do you know who you are now? Okay, tell me, like, who, who are you now? In the most universal sense, I am just awareness. I am just awareness being aware of awareness. The persona is transient. The persona is temporary. The persona has a beginning if in time, and therefore the persona has an ending in time. So I am definitely not the persona, but if you want to ask more specifically about who Andro is, the, the temporary persona, which we name Andro for convenience, because that's my name, coincidentally, uh, I've come to a very interesting realization that even when I had this fake 
persona or wall of, of sarcasm and cynicism and fuck it all attitude. Even then, I was the same person that I am now. I was just buried under all those insecurities and indoctrinations and, and parental influences and, and school influences. And, but when I look back at my life, not even long before my father died, when I was four years old, three years old, seven years old, I'm looking back, I, I didn't have the words, I didn't have the, the vocabulary, I didn't have the, the verbal eloquence, but it was still the same me. Looking back, I felt the same as I feel today. So this brought me to the realization that people don't actually change. Like as children, we are already born as what we, we already will have been. But we're so much covered in layers of programs and narratives and indoctrination and labels and fuck. <laughs> and, and no wonder we get lost and build those fake personas because we're missing a real one. Although temporary, that's what I'm working with. This is the andro that I'm working with. This andro came into being and this andro will be gone. But the essence, the goddess funk, the, the, the divine spark that I am and it cannot be destroyed is infinite. But the persona is a temporary thing and I accept it as such. Hmm. And this persona was no different when I was four and, and seven years old it was no different than what it is now. I didn't have the words to express it. I didn't have the training. I didn't have the social skills to come across as Andrew of today, but it was the same fucking Andrew. Okay. The same fucking uh, rebelliousness, the same uh, psychic connection, the same attraction to, to the greatest mysteries of the universe. They were always there. And when I did my own regressions and my own like, recapitulations of life, I realized I haven't changed at all. I've acquired some skills of projecting myself better, such as words. They're good for convenience sake. <laughs> yeah. But they're just words. The, this Andrew was there from the very beginning of his physical life. Yeah. He was this, what you're talking with now, was always there. It never changed. And after the, the layers are, like he, I'm going to repeat it because it's, it's a very good point, I think. We do not have to turn on the sun. It was always on. We just have to remove the fucking clouds. And once the clouds are removed through this method that I advocate very much, the via negativa, we remove all that is not us. And invariably, we'll, we're going to arrive at what is what we is, what we are. And by removing the, the clouds, we discover the sun. But many people are obsessively and, and hardly working on, on, on making a, creating a sun. Yeah. There's no need to reinvent the sun. We only have to remove the clouds. And there's plenty of clouds, and there's more clouds as we get older, as we get more programmed. And unfortunately, you look at many people uh, in their 70s or 80s even, and there's, sadly, though, there's hardly anything left of them. They've all become a complete robot with very fixed routines. And if something is not in its right place, they can go like completely batshit crazy because their routine has become everything. The child is gone. It's not gone. It's just so deeply buried. We might as well call it dead. It's very scary. It's very scary to watch a lot of people turn into zombies because they're burying the emotion so deep. This scares me a lot. It's, it's scary, but uh, what you have to do is, is make sure it doesn't happen to you. And only by doing this, you'll be leading by example. But then it causes more, it causes more suffering, though. If you, when you hold on to it, sometimes I feel that it's less painful to, to live that way. Like, I don't really blame people who don't dig deep uh, because the other side is not always easy. It's a, it's a pretty rough terrain to hold on to your emotions and, and to, to unearth all of this rubble that you're, you've been buried under. 
Well, do the best you can, but uh, but it's like the one of my favorite examples uh, when you're on an airplane and they give you all these instructions, like in case of loss of cabin pressure, uh, the gas, the oxygen mask will, will fall down and always put your mask on first because if you can't breathe, you can't help anyone else breathe. So right. first make sure you, you can breathe before you're even thinking about the whales and the other people and, and, and the forests. Make sure you can breathe. Make sure you are not programmed. Make sure you don't get emotionally immersed into narratives that are not necessarily native to you. Because we cannot solve a problem while being immersed in it at the same time. Yeah. It's like the famous uh, quote that's attributed to Archimedes, give me an external point of leverage and I can move the world. So you have to solve a problem you cannot afford, you cannot technically be immersed in the problem. Otherwise, if you are immersed in the problem, and you keep talking about what about all the suffering, what can we do, you, it may sound harsh what I'm saying, but you are part of the fucking problem. Right. Because you are immersed in it. So be at the center, be at the eye of the storm, do not become immersed in the narratives. And then just by your presence, the way you live will be broadcast. There's an ancient saying, I don't know from what tradition, but I think it's in my traditions that the work of the holy or the righteous is done on its own. I like that. I like that quote a lot. So it's, you, you are extremely active, but not by not really doing anything at all, except doing you or being you more accurately. May I share uh, what I struggle with, like, uh, in all of this, it's like, all of these truths are, even though I, I know them to be true, and um, there was uh, in an ayahuasca journey, uh, I had this vision of somebody just hacking away at my heart, and I, I was asking for my heart to heal. And then I was like, why are you doing this to my heart? And it turns out it wasn't my heart. It was like cement that buried my heart until I saw the light. And that emotion I will never forget. And I felt immense gratitude. I felt things that I didn't know I could feel. And then I go back to into the world. And like you said, I've become part of the problem, even though you do have access to this information and that emotion. And then you go back after a while. It's very, I, how do you, my question is, I guess, is how do you hold on to your light? No matter what's happening around you. You don't hold on. Huh? Say it. The, the mechanics of it is that the only thing that you really want to keep, which is your like, I call it Gottes Funk because it's German, it comes naturally, but it's uh, the divine spark, that the thing that in the core of you that is awareness, being aware of awareness that has no beginning and no end and can never be created and can never be destroyed, this thing will never go away no matter how much you push it away. And the rest is irrelevant and when it's time to for it to go, it will go. You don't need to hold on to anything. Like holding on is is hoarding narratives that are not necessarily needed anymore. You don't have to hold on to anything. That's the temporal ego speaking. We need to hold on to this. Hold on to my precious, precious. <laughs> I need it so much. I need to hold on to it so tight. It's my precious. Oh, I've worked so hard on it. It's precious. I want it. They want to take it away from us now. That's hilarious. To it's true. <laughs> you don't need to hold on to anything. That's the answer that you were looking for. You don't need to hold on. 
because whatever you need will stay anyway. And when it's no longer needed, it will fly away. Don't hold on. But you do believe that we create our own reality and it stands to reason that we need to remember what narrative we're writing next rather than it's a balance I suppose between letting go and creating something what we can do is navigate our boat on the ocean of reality we can navigate our we can control our boat boat but we cannot control the ocean right and exactly. even if we could there's like a high level of mastery and we wouldn't be there like we would, we would already be the ocean but as long as we navigate we can control our boats and our vehicles and our vessels this we can control we can be great navigators we can be shit navigators some of us can go through fantastic places some of us can sink halfway but we cannot control the ocean we come from the ocean and we cannot control the source that we have emerged from okay so we are creating reality by the way that we navigate it but we don't write reality it's because reality is completely decentralized what do you mean by decentralized there's not uh someone described the universe as being a circle whose center is everywhere right so the center of reality is everywhere and each and every one of us is a center but there are so many of us it's like solving the paradox of solipsism i can say that i am the only conscious being in the universe and so is everybody else because it's one consciousness and it's isn't it projecting everything projecting itself through everything well you'll have to watch the secret fire webinar for that because i i cannot cover this in just one meeting it's where can i see that it's on uh, liberatelife.com okay look for the secret fire this is my life's work uh it's like 25 hours 25 and a half hours of recorded material um i don't think you'll find this stuff anywhere else today um like it it goes way beyond shamanism it it offers a model of reality that is not just theoretical it's utilitarian it's useful we can apply it in practice because it's logical it's coherent you don't have have to be a great mystic to use it you don't have to be a super intellectual you just have to have a little bit of intuition and a little bit of common sense and just things will start connecting and falling into place can you define coherence the heart mind coherence how do you define the lack of conflict within a narrative uh the it's like different points or different clocks they're all like synchronized to the same beat like you can get from anywhere to anywhere else without friction like every all communications are instant you can make connections without having to rationalize them it's uh that's my own definition of coherence you can look it up uh, in a dictionary uh i think it's quite limited but coherence is as compared to a great organism made of many parts and all these parts although they're different they are aligned to the same purpose and they all complement each other so it's one system completely decentralized and every node or point is different and yet they work in unison for the same goal and every point has instant access to all the others like perfect connectivity perfect telepathy perfect communication perfect 
synchronization. And there's no conflict in the narrative. We can compare uh, the narrative of the, the human body or emotional body. Like if our uh, brain works fine, but our heart not so good, then we will have a lack of coherence. If our brain and heart work well, but the liver and kidneys work on a different frequency, at some point we're going to have problems. So instead of seeing it as like, oh, you have kidney problems, it's more like you have coherence problem. Your kidney and your heart don't communicate too well. We have to adjust them. There's like a, they work, they're working in different time zones. Your, your kidneys are in LA and <laughs> the spleen is in, uh, on the East Coast. Right. Virginia, Virginia Beach. Okay. <laughs> um, so by allegory, I can describe the way I see coherence. So what's the gateway to coherence put simply for people that are not really able to, to find it? Uh, coherence once, uh, the blockages are removed, becomes self-evident. Um, I cannot give you a recipe for how to achieve coherence. I'm not big on recipes. Right. But you, if one understands the philosophy behind it, uh, we can apply coherence in, in best example I can come up with is in personal interactions. Uh, if you study or look at random interactions between people, eventually there will be some conflict. Eventually there will, someone will have a need to be right and someone will have a need for the other person to be wrong in order for them to be right. Now, where I am right now, I'm always right. In my view, nobody is ever wrong because the scale only measures one thing. The thermometer doesn't measure hot and cold. It measures temperature. Okay, there's no line that says here is where cold stops and warm begins. This is where wrong stops and right begins. The thermometer of righteousness only measures how right I am. I can be a little right. I can be more right. I can be like, wow, I'm so right. But I'm always right. We're never wrong. I, there are no negatives. Like, ironically, when you practice via negativa, you start negating literally everything. And ironically, the last thing you negate is negation itself. So even if operating the via negativa all the way, the last thing we negate is negation, we arrive at a positive. There is no nothing. We negate negation. That's the culmination of the via negativa. We will always arrive at a positive. There is no negative. There is no wrong but it can always be a bit more right. So going back to coherence in interpersonal conversations or interactions, uh, one will not only need to feel right, but for them to be right, they will need the other person to be wrong. And this is how we lose coherence, and this is how we lose one of the most amazing things that can happen, which is common ground. Like if I was religious, I would call it holy ground, but I call it common ground because c common ground is where we're both right. It's like when the two spheres merge and we have like this portion here that we have in common. And common ground is where the magic happens. And if we seek that common ground, if we don't seek to focus on the differences, and if we find that common ground, I don't believe in seeking, I believe in finding big difference. Seekers will always seek and never find. Finders will just find. They're like two different species almost. Uh, if we focus on that common ground and if we find it, then this common ground will expand gradually and hopefully also exponentially. And it's a key to the most wonderful relationship. But if we focus on what's different, if we focus on what's wrong, 
if we focus on needing to be right at the expense of someone else being wrong, goodbye common ground. Chaos, entropy, complete loss of coherence. But once we found common ground, we start to synchronize and the liver and the spleen are on GMT, UTC time. All synchronized. <laughs> Right. It's totally okay. Uh, I think people feel threatened when they feel they might be wrong. I think everybody is right at all times because... Well, I just said that. Exactly. So and your audience, whoever's listening to this, you, you can never be wrong, but you can always be more right. Because again, if you practice via negativa all the way, the last thing you negate is negation itself and you will inevitably arrive at a positive. There is no nothing. The last thing you negate is negation. Don't we achieve that when we die though? Like we need to die to get to that point? No, 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 no. Uh, death is not the end. Like we can get, I don't want to get into this incarnation and recycling thing too much. Uh, there is a way to control uh, our incarnations. There is a way to like exit them completely. Again, go to liberatelife.com and watch The Secret Fire. It's all in there. It's literally my life's work. But no, uh, any unsolved issues uh, we have when we die, we take them with us. Right, yeah. That's why like, it, I do not recommend suicide for everyone. Anyone, I mean. I do not recommend suicide for anyone. It doesn't solve anyone. If anyone here is listening and contemplating suicide, don't do it. It's stupid. It doesn't solve anything. All the problems, you take them with you. Okay? Just don't do it. Thank you for uh, inserting that in the conversation. It's very important for people to to understand. It's useless. I mean, if if, you, if it would have been utilitarian or useful for something, I would not be... I would probably be recommending it, but it's useless. Like all the problem, I mean, except like if someone is in pain and on, on life support, it, of course, it's their choice to be taken off life support at a certain point if all there is is pain. But if we have emotional problems or like many teenagers commit suicide for heartbreak or for like not being accepted or for a million reasons, the problems continue. Suicide does not solve our mental and social problems the problem remains suicide is not a solution for solving problems it just doesn't work from a strictly mechanical utilitarian perspective not a moralistic one i want to be practical here it's just useless don't do it it's it's an it's an absolutely important uh, point uh, i've i've gone through that uh, edge before and once again it was ayahuasca that showed me how the energy and the emotions that are unforgiven they just go with me and and it's somewhere uh, it, it's just a horrible concept it's it, it's completely useless and it's uh, the best thing to do is to do away and with these emotions while we're here and then when we go we go uh, but I think the, the the lighter we are in our emotions, like the more we die where we're alive, the the easier the transition. I feel that. I feel this is how we eventually transition naturally, lightly, when we sort through the emotions while we're here. If you have the time, go to my website, liberatelife.com, and read the blog entry. It's called Very Important. Just read it. I would advise everyone to visit the website as well. It's it's full of incredible content. Uh, liberate. I would. I, I will actually write the the, the link um, below in the comments, for, so it's always uh, okay accessible for everybody. Liberate. Whoever needs to find it will find it. Yeah, and uh, also to check out your poetry. Uh, may I just uh, say, like the the one. X marks the spot. I highlighted some sentences. It blew me away. Um, I don't remember it, but if you can read those things to me, then. 
they're just excerpts. I don't, I don't I really want to ruin it by explaining or commenting, but uh, no, I like, know. Maybe I, you read. Maybe I you read it and tell me what you make of it. Uh, sure. Uh, I just I I fell in love with the X marks the spot where the war is uh, where the war is over, and silence dethrones the words. I love that sentence. Silence dethrones the words. It's absolutely brilliant. And then uh, you have uh, X marks the spot where uh, of glorious indifference. I got very intrigued why you chose to describe indifference as something glorious. And finally, sine wave. the sine wave flatten the curve. <laughs> flatten the curve. It's glorious. glorious indifference. No, you're going to need to dive into that. You can dive. I mean, I, I will not interpret my own my own fucking poetry. It's it's up to you. All right. It's not layered anyway. Where magic and loss fall in love and give birth to you. Where I am, and I am in capitals. Uh, that's the end. Like the. It's this is beautiful writing, and uh, it's it's quite endless how you can interpret that, and it just I I know how, how it made me feel when I read it. And it doesn't really matter what you meant by it, uh, because I'm sure you didn't write it by thinking, oh, I'm going to write a piece of poem. You just wrote it. It's so authentic. Glorious indifference gave me different thoughts because I guess I write a lot about indifference. It, it, indifference kind of bothers me. <laughs> Uh, but there is a glory to it at the same time. It's very intriguing that you chose that combination, that glory. No, I, I didn't choose anything. When you when, when you when you write in this way, that you basically allow the poem to write itself. Right. Right. We just eliminate the distractions. A vessel. I like to call it the vessel. It's not just the best. I mean, uh, I am obviously present, but uh, and I like, I can like refine the grammar and like put in some clever bits. But the the main body of the poem or of the song or whatever work of art it is, the main essence of it kind of writes itself, and then you know the logic and intuition come in, and we can add in the clever bits and the the rhymes and like fix the structure a bit, but. Uh, so yes, there is some input from the conscious me, but the main thing kind of writes itself. And also it's like um, this particular kind of writing, like the poem that you quoted, it's uh, as much as I don't like the word mystical, it is a sort of mystical writing or magical writing because it, is, it conveys archetypes. It It's not really a narrative. It's not really a story. It's a conveyor. It's like a, tight package loaded with archetypes. I can't write books. I don't have the patience for writing books. So I write these short things and they are like compressed zip files of strong archetypes. Uh, that was going to be my question, why you're not writing a book, because I think we could all use it. <laughs> I went to the Monroe Institute in, in Virginia um, maybe 25 years ago. I don't know if you heard about the Monroe Institute. It's not a body training program. Uh, and we all got interviewed by the coaches there. I was much younger, much less experienced. and uh, But still, I had this like fire inside me, and one of the coaches told me like, oh, you should write a book, Andrew. She had this deep voice. You should write a book, Andrew. And uh, it never happened. It never happened. I can say so much more in, in a few verses of poetry than an entire book. And I'm better at speaking. Like, as far as my skills are concerned, I'm better at speaking than at writing. Right. 
So this is why I did this. Uh, like you'll find some writings on the website, but you'll you'll find my 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 legacy. <laughs> I don't like the word that much, but it's like the the culmination of my life's work so far. You'll just find it in, in three seminars: yeah, shamanic vision, uh, the secret fire, which is the mother mothership, and uh, expel, which basically teaches people how to cast spells. The principle of spell casting. It's very useful to improve one's life conditions. Don't overuse it, but it works. You you were uh, it, it, it is mentioned on on the website that you give workshops in magic and spells and. Um... Well, they're all recorded now. I will not be doing any live workshops anymore. Mm. Not that I know of. I've done many seminars and workshops live with live people over many years, uh, mostly about shamanism, about other topics as well. Mm. Um, then I could not do it live anymore for whatever happened during the past uh, three years mm -hmm. or so. It's four years almost, yeah. And uh, so I couldn't do it live anymore, so... A year ago, I decided to like just gather the most refined, most exquisite extract and quintessential uh, substance from all I've discovered in my life so far and put it in just one concentrated online seminar or as they call the webinar. And uh, we had like 30 participants to whom I'm extremely grateful for taking this journey together with me. And it went over like four and a half weekends, nine meetings, like three to four hours each. Uh, it was very intense for everybody, myself included. And it basically, it's my life's work so far. Uh, and I, I cannot describe what a secret fire is. Uh, you have to experience it. You can look at the testimonials. Some of them are written. Some of them are video. And people are saying, like, I've been waiting for this all my life. Like, holy shit, what, what, what the fuck just happened? What, what is it? It's, like, completely outside the spectrum of anything that's available. Uh, I'm not saying this to, like, blow my own horn or, like, pat myself on the shoulder. It's just... <laughs> it's funny. I, I got blown away by this as well. I mean, I was... I was a student of this webinar while I was teaching it. And I've watched it again, uh, and I've learned new things. Like, I was equally a student. I was just a mouthpiece that just happened to deliver it. But uh, it was a convergence of correlated events that converged into one event that turned out to be this secret fire, which is absolutely, completely magical. And, and I was... While I happened to be the mouthpiece for it, I was equally a student myself as well. And that's what makes you a good teacher is because you are a student of, of that teaching. Well, I, I don't really believe you can teach anyone anything, but you can remove blockages and, and connect some dots and teach how, someone how to learn themselves right. how, or how to unlearn. Remember my, my, my classic, we do not have to turn on the sun, it's always on. So my job is to hopefully help remove some of the clouds, my own included. So you never think of um, trying plant medicine also? I mean, I understand the initiation by life and your journey has been already pretty profound and you don't necessarily need the plant medicine, but aren't you curious to see if it opens up something else? It has nothing to do with curiosity. It's just what I sense that is needed for me or not. Absolutely. I have never felt this need. If, should the need ever arise, I will not uh, deny it. Okay. So far, it's never been there. And uh, according to at least some people who <laughs> participated in my seminars, I kind of like on my own, I'm acting like a psychedelic substance. So <laughs> I guess that I don't do psychedelics because I am psychedelics, but uh, <laughs> it's an acquired skill. 
Uh, it's pretty uh, badass, you know. I am the psychedelic. I don't need the second. I love that. It's uh, and and you are a bit like talking to you just kind of put me in a bit of a trance, you know. It, it the energy is definitely palpable, you know. Um, I want to see if I have. Yes, I, I, I might have brushed on this question before, but I, I want to get your thoughts on, um, do you agree that we need to feel safe in order to, to really create? Because I, I think creativity cannot live in survival mode. And, and there's so much that is, pushing us to be in survival mode. What Do you think that we need this sense of safety, even though life by definition is not necessarily safe because nobody knows what the hell is Have you noticed happen? that people in survival mode can get extremely creative? Not in the moment of survival mode. I, th I see people who are suffering or going through like, a lot. And the too. direct threat of like life, uh, like clear and present imminent danger, maybe we have like a paralysis. But right. if uh, the stressor is uh, not acute but uh, chronic, we tend to either succumb to it and become like even more programmed or we tend to be much more creative. Like whenever something is happening in the world, like a big economic depression, everybody loses everything, there will always be some people who make lots of money. Yeah. During this depression, they're like every time there is uh, there are increased controls, like in I don't know, like communist Russia, for example, in like a hundred years ago, uh, the black markets were flourishing in the Eastern Bloc. Like someone always gets creative, and the more stress is imposed, the more the more people will find ways around it. People who are not paralyzed. A stressor can be an enemy or a friend. It's not inherently any, uh, any of those. A stressor is just something, remember at the beginning of our conversation, it's just something that happens. How we process it, we cannot control what happens. We can control how we navigate it. The stressor, the stressor, stressor, the stressor is like a wave in the ocean. We cannot control the ocean. What we can control is how we navigate it. So we can be stressed and creative and we can be stressed and paralyzed. We can be happy and creative. We can be happy and comfortably fucking numb. Yeah. And that's not even happiness. Right. So... Uh, safety is not a necessary precursor for creativity. It can be nice, but an artist never feels safe because an artist, a creator, knows that they're always navigating the stormy waters of reality, even if the, the solid floor gives us the illusion of stability. But we also, we've also touched on this in the beginning of our conversation that stability, come on, what is really stable in this life? <laughs> yeah, that was a great uh, opener to the conversation. <laughs> yeah, but like, see, because we're coherent, we can return to that point and create like a convergence between events that happened before that are happening now in this conversation. So basically, this whole thing turns into one coherent event in which all parts relate to each other. Right. And I don't even have to do it intentionally; it just happens. I think I need to digest uh, the whole conversation. I and I I I would want to talk to you again. <laughs> this is how I feel right now. I enjoy talking with you very much. I'm I'm open to do it again if you if you want to. I I would I would love that. I like. I feel that we didn't really scratch the surface of of you. I'm not important here. It's uh, 
like whenever I whenever I'm teaching seminars and workshops, I always say like I'm not special in any way. I just like I had a certain set of circumstances. I learned a few things, but those things can be taught, and it's not even that difficult to apply them. I I do have another question. I forgot to uh, you. You said something in one of your YouTube videos. Uh, I think it was a conversation with somebody who wasn't on camera. And uh, you were saying you think that sharing your awakening is can be cruel um, because we deny the other person of the discovery uh, on their own. The ecstasy and the, the, the yeah, yeah. So I can provide, uh, I can provide people with the the maps and the tools and the hiking boots, but the journey uh, I cannot do it for them. The journey they will have to do it alone. So I'm this little shop like at the edge of the forest that sells the maps and the compasses and the and the hiking tools and the boots and everything. But the map is never the territory, and the journey you'll have to walk it alone, uh, just as I have to walk mine. That's quite the visual. I totally saw that. So you giving out the boots and the maps <laughs> by the forest. Yeah, that's that's. I'm, I'm the I'm the I'm the camping shop, the hiking shop. <laughs> but uh, the journey, I cannot take it instead of you. Okay, so it is okay to to share uh, the tools. Uh, you were only referring to the people that beat us over the head with it, like when they have a discovery and then they start to scream it into the world which kind of becomes off-putting to others. I, I'm not that much of a screamer, but uh, <laughs> I had this intuition to to like roll a camera and the audio recorder on a few occasions when I did this stuff, and it came out pretty good, and uh, people found it beneficial. So we invested, like me and my, my brothers here, we invested a whole year in editing everything and making this website. It's new. We had a, another website that's no longer online. Uh, so we created uh, Liberate Life, which is an appropriate title. Liberate Life. That's what we're about. And uh, um, on this website, I've, I've concentrated all the recorded materials. Yes, please. Oh, can you tell me how you guys found each other, like the three of you, uh, you... Uh, Algus, uh, is it? And Adam? Ben, uh, and Adam, yes. Uh, uh, by not looking. It just happened. Uh, Like-minded people uh, meet and at some point we decided like to do projects together and then even like share a house together and we moved like different countries and uh, we're still stuck together and we kind of complement each other, and everyone has different skills. And I'm good at certain things, but I suck at so much else. And and August is very good with technical stuff and editing and digital stuff. And uh, and we we kind of like a little, very small, uh, limited community. Like the right people need to meet, and uh, um, it it just whatever uh, I've done or shared. I could have never done it alone. It's like we met and decided to like live and work together and only years later it turned out why it even happened. We figured out. Maybe not completely, but uh, like none of what I did, the, the, the seminars, the information that I've shared, I could not have done it alone. And we share a, a need to like leave the world behind. We we left Europe and we moved to this remote island in the Atlantic, and uh, just we live in a small village, and we have chickens and for eggs and nice garden and uh, yeah, a simple life basically. I think I think that's beautiful. I think. Uh... Living uh, a bit uh, off the grid and uh, living simply is, uh, I think that's the ultimate success, uh, really. Like, n not the, all the other 
noise, I suppose. I mean, I run, it's not that simple. I mean, we're not living in a cave. We have electricity and computers and lights and, and microphones and audio cards and stuff, stuff we've been like gathering over the years. And we have, ironically, we have faster internet than we had in Western Europe. But um, it's still a village in, in on an island in the middle of the ocean. So I wake up in the morning, I see the ocean, and I'm, it's okay. Yeah. So that I, I wouldn't call that. Uh, you always refer to the wall, like breaking the wall and, and being open and going through the cracks. Um, so... Do you find do you find it easy to balance between um, having that wall and being open at the same time, like to like to be open but also not completely immersed? So, just to to make sure I understand you, is that you are there's no wall anymore. There's just a lack of immersion. The, the wall is long gone. It's gone, but with like, like just an observer, like you're an observer without being taken in. You know, in many ways, yes. Sometimes I will engage briefly, not for too long. But uh, the wall is gone, but it was replaced by a different phenomenon that's quite interesting. Um, some people, they notice me and they like want to speak to me or like, maybe I slipped in the secret, which I can't. And and other people would just like feel like repelled. They just oh, this like weird person. Like I want to stay away from him. And it's it's good both ways. Like it keeps certain people away from me, and it attracts the right attracts the right ones. And and even that quite rarely. So there's no wall, but it like kind of my energy signature, for lack of a better term, it kind of like does its own retraction, attraction, and repulsion. Like autonomous, autonomously, autonomously, that's the right word. So there's no need for a wall. Even though I do have magical protection set up around the house, just in case. You have protectors? I have magical protection magical. around the house, yeah. Uh, explain yeah. that. It's just a magical shield that doesn't allow any uh, bad influences to enter. Okay. So you're using uh, energy, or or is it like natural, natural stuff like her? Uh, I, I I will not go into the details right now. Okay. <laughs> I explained it in in the spanning webinar. Okay. Uh, I, I, I will not check like, it out. Uh, that's, we're not gonna make it a like a magical tutorial right now, right? Okay. Because you know I, I'll just never stop; it will never end. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's possible and and it's teachable. This has been a, a fascinating uh, conversation. That is the I, the beauty of it is that it's totally unexpected. Um, it has nothing to do with, or maybe some things to do with my initial, very initial intention, but like, I'm so glad that we got to talk and, and meet. It's uh, it's pretty fascinating and eye-opening. The material is, is um, different. It's definitely different. And I'm really glad it's out there. Um, I also Thank love you. the YouTube channel. I think besides the website, like people, are you going to be updating, like adding more videos to your YouTube channel? Uh, I guess so. This is more like August department, but uh, yes, I suppose it's, we had this channel for a long time, but we didn't really have any content we deemed valuable enough to put it out there. But uh, now we would like to make our, uh, our basically our, our, our three webinars, which contain my whole life's work, so to speak, 
um, I would like them to be accessible and to pe- for people to find them if it's via YouTube or other media. We apparently we have a Twitter and a, and an Instagram and all this stuff that I had no idea they. Even, I I mean I knew they existed but never really yeah. used them before. But we would like it to get out there and for those who need to find it to actually find it. Um. So yes, there will be most likely more. Uh, snippets and uh, YouTube uploads and other medias, and you joined our uh, our other social media platform already. I saw you joined. Yes, so I welcome. have. Um, so we have a few places where we like share and interact, and uh, and there are some really awesome people that have been walking this journey with us for the past eight, nine, ten years. And uh, some of us stuck with us and we're walking this journey together and it's it's wonderful. What uh, I would love to do is uh, digest all of this conversation and um, if you don't mind, uh, if we can like have another talk soon after I uh, maybe watch what we just did and uh, just gather more thoughts. I would love to talk to you about a lot of other things about life and uh, the human uh, conditions. <laughs> I'm, I'm really honored to have spoken to you today. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me too. Uh, it's it's okay to be speechless. Um, words are just for convenience. You know, when silence dethrones the words, the part that you like from the poem. Well, it has been a pleasure to have Andrew uh, with me today in this conversation. The The reason I reached out to him was for one thing, and then it ended up being like so much more because he is so much more than what I saw on his YouTube channel and his website. Um, it, we will continue the conversation again. Like we're going to have a, a, another recording with, with Andrew to dive a bit deeper maybe, um, talk about different other things. And um, at the same time, I'm very grateful that he so graciously accepted to talk to me for Wild Vine Festival. And right now it just feels like a masterclass in life, just talking to Andrew today. So uh, I really appreciate that you so kindly agreed to talk with me. Thank you very much. It, uh, the pleasure was on my side as well. Um, I'm very grateful for how this interaction magically happened and this collection connection was made. And I'm looking forward to see you next time. Me too. Thank you so much. <laughs>